Um, just want to say to you that when it comes to the pulpit here at Faith Outreach Center, as you know, um, with Pastor Flowers, uh, we take this pulpit very seriously. It is not a place where you get up and just say anything. We only have the right to speak that which is the word of God. And we take that very seriously because God loves you. And he doesn't want you to hear anything else from this pulpit other than what thus saith the word of God. Amen. And so each time that we stand in the pulpit, you know, we, we don't take it as a slight thing. Because we understand that those who stand behind this pulpit will have to answer to God as to what he said to his people, what was said to his people. And so it is something that weighs very much on us. Pastor Flowers has been, as you, if you have been here for the last several weeks, he has been on a series entitled Holy Ghost Health Care. And as I was thinking in terms of um, what I was going to say to you this morning, I was impressed not to go to another subject, but to stay right in the, in the vein of that um, series. Now, I won't be using his title this morning. I'll leave that to him. But let me say this to you. The reason why... Uh, Pastor Flowers came, uh, was preaching or teaching this particular series is because he noticed something within the congregation. We had a guest minister here some several weeks ago, and and about 95 percent or so of our congregation, it was the the gentleman was was ministering on healing, and when it was time for an altar call regarding healing, about 95 percent of our congregation responded. Now, what that says to, to us is that we have a tremendous amount of our people here that are suffering with some type of physical ailment. And so what, what Pastor uh, has, has done is to begin to teach you what God's Word says about healing from the standpoint of the atonement, that which Jesus has, has, has gained for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And what he has done is not, not to give you a quick fix but to get you to the point where your faith becomes solidified, not in what you feel, not in what some man has said, but in what God's word has said. And so we're working that process, hence the series of, of, of messages is to each time is to give you another layer of, of the word so that you can, your faith can be built up. You know, we, what we receive from God, we receive by faith. You understand that, correct? Everything that we receive from God, we receive by faith. Amen. So I'm going to continue along that uh, line this morning. I'm going to attract your attention to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. My title that I'm using is The Source of Healing Power. The Source of Healing Power power. And I want to go to Acts chapter 14 first because in Acts chapter 14 we have a story. And I, I want to set the context. The context is the meaning. What's going on in this particular uh, passage. And what we find here is that Paul and Barnabas, they are, they are in this area called uh, Galatia. Gal can you say Galatia? Galatia? Now within that region you have these particular cities or towns and one of the towns that they're currently in when we look at Galish, I mean Acts chapter 14 again at verse 1 they're in a town called Iconium can you say Iconium Iconium they're in Iconium and you know what they're doing there they're preaching the gospel that doesn't sound like a bad thing does it they're just preaching the gospel the gospel is good news so they're preaching good news to people but what's happening in Iconium is this you have some people about half of the people that like what they're preaching you have about half of them that don't like it mixed audience and so what happens is is that the people that don't like it decided that they're going to persecute them beat them stone them kill them that's pretty serious isn't it yeah. so Paul and Barnabas what did they do they leave Iconium Right? I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? If they want to kill you, obviously they don't want you there, so you leave. So they leave Iconia, and they come to another town called Lystra. Can you say Lystra? So now they're in Lystra. Guess what they're doing in Lystra? They're preaching the gospel. Now we pick this up in verse 7 of Acts chapter 14, and notice what the scripture starts off there. It says, and there they did what? They preach the gospel. They preach the gospel. And the scripture goes on to say, in Lystra there sat a man 
crippled in his feet, crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. Now, you know, the, the scripture is very interesting. It's very interesting, how, you know, how God says things sometimes. Because notice the emphasis in this particular verse. God wants you to know this man couldn't walk. So he spells it out here. Crippled in his feet, lame from birth, and had never walked. By the way, that's the, that eighth birth is the NIV translation, just for you people that don't like that. <laughs> So he's crippled in his feet, lame from birth, and had never walked, never walked. But notice what the scripture goes on to say. Verse 9, it says, the same heard Paul speak. So this man who was crippled in his feet, lame from birth, and had never walked, he's there and he's listening to Paul speak. Now we know that according to verse 7, Paul is doing what? Preaching what? the gospel. So this man is sitting there listening to the gospel. Notice what the scripture brings out though. It says, here we are, now this is the King James rendering, all right? The same heard Paul speak. Now what does that mean? Because again, anytime scripture says something, it says it for a reason. It says it in a certain way for a reason. And see, what God is revealing to us is that this man just wasn't a casual listener. He wasn't just sitting in church thinking about what he was going to have for lunch. He wasn't thinking about, you know, who, who he was going to hook up with after. No, when it says this, it says he, he heard Paul speak. That meant that he was intent, intentionally listening. He was not being distracted by anything. It was like his eyes were glued to Paul. Gives us an indication how we should be listening to the word of God. So the same heard Paul speak, and notice what happened. Paul, by the Spirit, notice what the scripture goes on to say, who steadfastly beholding him. It's interesting in the Greek that the word steadfastly and the word beholding is the same word. What does that mean? It means that the Spirit of God prompt Paul to look at this man and how intensely this man was listening. The scripture goes on. And in that, Paul, the scripture says this, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Faith to be healed. How did he know that? Well, the man was intently listening. And Paul saw that and he was prompt by the Spirit to note that this man had faith to be healed. Now the scripture tells us this, that faith cometh how? By hearing and hearing the word of God. No other way. So faith for, for God's power only comes one way, and that one way is by hearing and hearing the word of God. I would add intensely hearing. Connect it. Distractions, distractions, distractions laid aside and intentionally listening. Scripture goes on to say, Paul said this, verse 10. Paul said to the man in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And the man leaped and walked. Now here at Lystra, these are Gentiles. These are what you would call barbaric type people. And the next verse, which I didn't uh, add here, but it goes on to say that the people who saw that these Lyconians, they begin to get, uh, in the, they begin to utter in their own languages, and they saw this miracle, and it so this excitement erupted in with them, and they they began to revert back to what their their Greek uh, mindset, and they thought Paul and Barnabas were Zeus or some you know gods, and so they went that direction. But here's the thing, here's the thing. In this idea of, of believing God for healing, what we have some mechanics and we have some fundamentals. You know, fundamentals are very, very important. Amen. Somebody said this, you know, in order to survive in life, you probably learn what you need to know in order to survive. And I'm probably about, about the third grade. What does that mean? Well, you learn to stand in line, right? Right? You go to typical school, what does that mean? You learn that you just can't barge on in and just step in front of people. You have to respect the rights of other people. Is that correct? Yes, you do. You learn how to say no. You learn how to, sometimes they tell you in school, what? Be quiet, right? A lot of times in life you have to be quiet, don't you? You can't say anything you want to say anytime, can you? No, you can't. 
So the idea about life has to do with what? Basic fundamentals. You think about the Spurs. The Spurs. Um, Go Spurs. <laughs> Welcome back. The Spurs, um, they, they almost pulled it off, amen? You know, and even though you might be a little disappointed, you have to admit they almost did it, right? They came close. Somebody said almost is not good enough. Well, it's, it's closer than not getting there at all. But here's the thing about the Spurs. The Spurs are not known as a basketball team for their, their uh, being spectacular, are they? Being, being someone who's out there showing off show. But they're, not known. they're known for what? They're known for fundamentals, aren't they? Fundamentals when it comes to defense, fundamentals when it comes to office. They're known for basic fundamentals. Uh, Tim Duncan, they, they refer to him as Mr. Fundamental. Now, what does that mean? It means that someone has taken the time, walked through the effort of mastering the basics. Mastering the basics. And what they do, they, they, they act out of this knowledge and this mastering of basics. Do you know that that's God's demand for the church? That we master the basics. You, you take, for instance, when we teach our little children, we teach them the ABCs, correct? That would be in the basics category, right? And yet, all of our language, if you speak English, um, what happens is, is that the English language is based on what? The basic alphabets, right? So that which you learn, even as a little tot, you're going to use that in regards to language for the rest of your life. Is that correct? Yes. The basics. So life is about basics. And when it comes to the things of God, and when it comes to receiving God from God, it's all about basics. Can you do the basics? If you can do the basics, you can get the results of the basics. You understand what I'm saying? Many times when we, you know, I was, uh, some time ago, many years ago, there was a preacher teaching other preachers how to preach. And he would emphasize, don't try and showboat. Don't try and show off. Don't try and be super smart. Get the basics. Give the people the basics. Success is always based on the basics. Are you listening to me? So look, let's look at this idea from base because what we see here in Acts chapter 14 is that in verse 7, the scripture says Paul preached what? The gospel. Now here's the thing. There's something about the gospel and this man, this lame man who was crippled from birth, lame from birth, who had never walked, him listening to the gospel created a degree of faith that a miracle was born out of that. Now here's the thing. If, if that works for him, if he could get healed that way, then if I understand something about the gospel, if I understand that giving my attention to the gospel and that there's something in the gospel that releases, it's a power in it. And if I can connect faith to it, then I can get the results that this man got because it's the fundamentals. Are you listening to me? The fundamentals. The fundamentals of God work for anybody, regardless of skin color, educational background what part of town you came from. It does not matter. The fundamentals work for everybody. So if I can get the fundamentals. So if I'm in a situation, if I'm in this audience and something is wrong with my body and the doctors don't know how to fix it perhaps, if I can just tap into the fundamentals of the gospel, the answer is in the gospel. Are you listening to me? Now, let's, let's look at this because if that's the case, then we need to look at the fundamentals, the basics. And I, and I would submit to you, somehow something has happened to the church. And when I talk about the church, I'm talking about the church as a whole, generally speaking. Somehow we have fallen into the trap of those who like the spectacular, who like the, the gleam and all that kind of thing, and we have somehow ignored the fundamentals. 
to the point if the truth were to be told, most don't even know the fundamentals. Oh, come on, somebody. So let's, let's do that this morning in the time that we have, and we can do this fairly quickly. But let's, let's look at this because it tells, I'm going to just look back at verse 7. It says, and there, what did they preach? They preach the gospel. So there's something about the gospel, right? Because it worked for this lame man. Something about the gospel. Let's look at, look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And here's what the scripture says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the what? The gospel. Because the gospel is what? The power of God. Unto, or you could say it this way, brings to me what? Salvation. Now here's, the th here's the, where we have to define some terms. This word salvation, what does it mean? Right there on the screen, if you can see that, the word there is soteria. Can you say soteria? It means what? It means to be rescued. It means to be made safe. It means to be delivered. It means to be made healthy. Oh, that's good right there. Made healthy. So here it says, it says that the gospel is this power that can do what? That can bring to me health. Oh, are you listening to me? So the question becomes, if that's true about the gospel, while we're in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, let's look at this a little bit closer. So the gospel, there's something about it that has such power in it. It can heal people. Now, here in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, notice what it says. It says that the gospel is the power of God. The word power there is the word dunamis. It means the supernatural ability of God. It means the divine energy of God. It means the divine glory of God. It also says this. It says the gospel is the power of God unto who? It brings salvation, right? But to who? Not everybody. Those who believe. So here's the thing. The gospel is here. Those who believe are here. If I can be a believer, then I can make a connection to the gospel. Does that make sense to you? So, so let's talk about this briefly. What, what does it mean to believe? Because sometimes that word becomes marginalized. This idea of believe means, well, I believe that it, it's going to be hot when I walk outside this building. <laughs> well, you know, that's not really prophetic there, is it? No, no, no. See, this word in the Bible, believe, doesn't mean that. This word goes much deeper in depth. It has much greater meaning. The word believe means this. Here it goes. It means those who would adhere to. What does that mean? The word adhere means to stick to. Uh -huh. See, it can't be just a momentary thing. When it comes to this idea of believing in regards to God, his mindset is that you believe. That means you stick. That means you're not going to leave. Good times, bad times, mediocre times. I'm not leaving. I'm stuck. Come on, are you listening to me? It means to, I, I adhere to this message called the gospel. It means that I rely on it. Here it is. What does it mean for me to rely on it? It means that I give up hope in everything else. My only hope is in the gospel. My only place of safety is the gospel. My reliance is in the gospel. So, so what happens? I adhere to it. I rely on it. I depend on it, and I follow the message. Amen. So if I'm going to say I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, what I have said is that for the rest of my life, I'm stuck. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, see, that's quite a different meaning than what most people think naturally because we have a tendency to take secular definition and apply them to spiritual words, and they don't work. So the gospel is something that I have to adhere to, trust in, rely on, depend on, stick to, not just one day, every day, throughout the day, throughout troubled times and difficult times and challenging times and good times and times where we're in praising and worship and times when it goes out and things don't look as good I stick to it. the gospel 
Now, let's define another term, and that is the gospel. Because the gospel then, there's something profound about this term, gospel. What is the gospel? The general idea, those who, who perhaps have been around church for now, they would say, well, the gospel is a good message. Well, that's, that's good. It's a good message, right? It's, it's good. It's not a bad message. But, but, but what else is it about the message? What is the gospel? Now, let's look. Are you still, are you still away? Look here with me, if you would, because we need to define terms. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says in verse 1, it says, Moreover, brother, I declare unto you what? The gospel. Do you see that? Which I preach. Here it is. He's talking about what did he preach? The gospel. And you, I'll tell you this. If you want to do a study on Paul, you'll find out what he preached was the gospel. That's what he preached, the gospel. Notice what he goes on to say. The gospel that I preached unto you, which ye are what? Which ye have received, and wherein what? You, you, you're, you're there sometime when you feel like it. No, where you stand. What does that mean? That's permanence. Every day. Regardless of what happened on the day, what happens in the job, what happens at home. Regard, I stand. But let's go on. Let's go on. You, you, you see that part. But let's look. I'm, I'm, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip down to verse 3. Notice what it says. He says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Who did he receive it from? He tells us in Galatians chapter 1, he received it from Jesus Christ. What did he receive? This is what he received. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So you can see one element of the gospel would be what? Christ died. Christ died. Let's go on. Let's go on because we're talking about how to, how to gain our healing. Look at this in verse 4. He says that not just that he died, however, that he was buried. He died. He was buried. But not just that he died and that he was buried, that he rose again. So in a nutshell, if you would, you know, there, there are other aspects, obviously, that we could turn. But just as, a, as, a, as if you wanted to compact this, what does this good message, what is the good message? The good message is that the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, here's the thing about the gospel, this message. God, God only one time performed this. He talks about it for almost 4,000 years as to what's going to happen, and then it happens, and then the rest of the Bible looks back to that which happened and tells us the meaning of it. So the idea of God is that this one event, Jesus dying, being buried, and arising again from the dead is the gospel, but it also is this. It is, here it is, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It is the power of God. What is the power of God? This death this burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is indeed God's power. God's power for what? God's power for healing. God's power to save me from, from sin, to rescue me from the power of the devil and demons, to rescue me from messed up sexual orientation, to rescue me from all kinds of uh, hurts and pains, the result of abuse. He is the gospel that rescues me. Only one thing, the gospel. Nothing else. Now you listen to me, listen, listen very carefully. It is God's idea that humans only had one need. They needed the gospel. Every, you listen, every ailment, every pain, every hurt, every dysfunction, every, every relapse, every tendency, Every prompting, that which is in secret that I'm ashamed of, God had one solution, and that solution was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because it is his power. See, here's the thing, here's the thing. Humans need power. But they need power beyond themselves. 
One of the, the distorted thinkings of deception is that we in and of ourselves are the answer to our problems. And when you see us trying to live that out, it is utterly foolishness. Because all we being the answer to our own problems does is drives us deeper into the problem. Do you hear what I'm saying? So in regards to this idea now, because the gospel does what? It takes care of my spirit. It takes care of the issues of my soul, my mind, will, and emotions. And then it also takes care of the issues of my body. Why is that the case? Because in the very beginning, the problem was what? My spirit, which affected my soul, this thing called the nature of sin. And the dominance of Satan. It affected my soul. And what did it do after that? It eventually did what? Affected my body. So the problem that humans have is a spiritual problem that can only be solved by a spiritual solution. And the spiritual solution is that which Jesus died when he did, when he died on the cross and when he arose from the dead. Now let's go back to this man, this man there in Lystra. Because the Bible tells us in Acts 14, verse 7, that Paul was there preaching what? The gospel. He wasn't preaching social justice. He wasn't preaching health care. He wasn't preaching um, uh, how you can, you know, be successful. He wasn't preaching how you could be, you know, have other people like you. He was preaching the gospel. Why would you stand there and say words? Because let's, let's, let's break this down. The gospel is what? A message. What is it about a message that you can stand and preach to somebody who was crippled from birth, lame from birth, and never walked in the, in the human psyche, the normal human psyche? It makes no sense. How can a man speak words to somebody who's never walked and that changed the situation? But see, what that demonstrates is the power of the gospel. It's a message, but not just a message. It is the message. And it has the power to heal people. You listen to me, listen, listen. The world, the world is hurting. We, 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 you know, Sister Janice was talking earlier about our experiences down there at, at City Hall. And what you, in all the things that were said from the opposing side, what you heard was a cry, a cry of pain and agony and no way to go and no way out. And so when we can't find a way out, when we can't find a way to escape our pain, what do we do? We build monuments to it and we try and justify and want everybody else to endorse it are you listening to me and see and see the church has been given the message that is the answer to all the world I wonder what would have happened if Paul would have said to that man you know um, we feel sorry for you y y your situation is bad we, we, you know, we heard for you. We wish we could do something. Would that have helped that man? We, we feel your pain. Here, here, here's a few dollars. Would, would that have solved his situation? He needed a power beyond human ability. I submit to you, that's what the gospel is. It's power beyond human ability. And it's power for every ailment of man, regardless of the health situation or the sickness or the disease or the issue of being lame. The gospel is the answer. But here's the key. Here's the key. It's the answer to those who are willing to adhere to it, rely upon it, Stick to it, yes. yield to it, yes. trust in it. Those who are not willing to do that, even though it has the potential to be their answer, it cannot be their answer because they won't yield to it. Here's the question this morning. 
Are you willing to yield to the message? Are you willing to yield the condition of your body to this message? Paul wasn't preaching himself. Paul didn't have to heal that man. It was the gospel that did. It was the supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me say this to you. Here's, here's how God's way works. Talking about basic fundamentals. First of all, here's the truth. Everything that you and I receive from God, guess how we get it? It has to come through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, here's the question. How do you get it from Jesus Christ? You get it by believing that what he did for you, his death, his burial, and his resurrection is the answer. So by you adhering to, relying on the reality of what the gospel means and is, your faith is in there. Now here's what happens. The Holy Spirit, the power of God, works only in the parameters of the gospel. That's why when Paul preached the gospel, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, gifts of working up miracles, gift of healing, could operate. Why? Because the Holy Spirit always works in agreement with, in conjunction with the gospel. The healing power of God will only be administered by the Holy Spirit. And he will only work in accordance to those who are believing the gospel. Amen. So when I put my trust in what Jesus did, and let's, let's just break this down even more so. That's why when you read the epistles, when you read the Bible, again, the Old Testament points to what Jesus was going to do. Faith. Old Testament saints had a faith in what he was going to do. The fact that he was going to come. In the New Testament, in the period where we live, what do we do? We look back to what he did. And because we look back to what he did, and we look intently at to what the word says, it releases the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me say this, but that's the only way the Holy Spirit is released. I remember back in my Pentecostal, I come from deep, deep, tough Pentecostal people. And you know, we, we used to have these Traditions, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you'll have a service and, and the presence of God would fall in one area of the building. And people, you know, would rock and shake and all. And, and, and legitimate stuff, you know, the power of God. And so what we would do is that we would think, okay, if I can get on that side of the building. <laughs> because that power that filled the, the last time is, is probably still over there. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of rotate through the building trying to find where that power was last time. If you can get in that same place, you got it. Interesting, it never worked for us. So, so here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. If the power of the Holy Spirit, as it in the case of this man in Lystra, if that power is going to be released to me, then there are elements that I have to do in, in relationship in regards to what that lame man did. I had to look intently at the gospel. I have, to be, I have to focus my heart on the gospel. I have to be willing to rely on the gospel Amen. and trust the gospel, Amen. what Jesus did. Yes. And by doing that, it releases the power Hallelujah. of God. Amen. Let me say this to you. Sometimes the gifts of the Holy Spirit will manifest and there will be an instantaneous healing but not in every time, not in every situation. Many times is what Pastor Flower is doing now. He's laying the groundwork to establish your faith. Because here's the thing, faith in what? Faith in the gospel does what? As my faith grows, as I look more intently, as I trust the gospel, then the Holy Spirit manifests through my degree of faith, and sometimes gradually there's a healing. Gradually I'm being made whole. Gradually sometimes. So I'm not just looking for something that happens just instantaneous. Because I must do what? 
I must adhere to, rely upon, trust in, not just one day, every day. And when I do that, I put myself in the sequence that the power of the Holy Spirit can work in my life. Listen, 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 listen. This is a guarantee. I don't care what the human uh, philosophers say. I don't care what the people in the secular world say. They don't know anything about this. How can they speak intelligently about it? I'm talking about what Jesus said and what Jesus did. So here's the question. Am I willing to trust the gospel in regards to what may be ill in my body? Am I willing to begin to let my faith grow, let my faith rise, trust the gospel? Now, here's the thing about the gospel. In that town of Lystra, you had one man who was lame from birth, crippled from birth, had never walked. He was engaged. You had other people in the same environment, hearing the same message. You know what they did? They jumped up and started calling for Zeus and other Greek gods. They completely missed the point. And do you know that in the hearing of the gospel when it's being taught, you have people sitting in the same audience and completely ignoring it. It's probably that way today. Completely distracted. And here, the source of everything they need. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And yet they turn to something secular going after another God. Every head bow, bow this morning. Every head bow. <coughs> Pastor, you, did you want to come up and say something? As I, I'm going to turn this over to Pastor Flowers for the altar call this morning. But I just want to pray with you right now. Just now, right where you are. Are you willing to be one who simply adheres to, relies upon, trust in that which Jesus has already done for you? Are you willing? If you are willing, it's guaranteed. It's only a matter of time. And in Jesus' name, Father, I pray across this audience, may your grace fall upon. May your people be receptive and may they discover a greater dimension of life that you have provided through the gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, give the Lord a hand of praise for his word. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have no greater source of hope than confidence. Confidence. Confidence that what God said, he does. That he's 100% faithful to his word. Everything Jesus died for is far-reaching. What he died for is far-reaching. Most of us uh, have limited what he died for to saving us from eternal hell. And that in and of itself is awesome. That I don't have to die and go to hell. But that's not all he died for. It's not all he died for. soul turmoil and trouble died for that too everywhere he bled from bled from his 
his head, a crown of thorns upon his head. All that mental anguish and pressure that you and I suffer. His blood. There is no, there's no remission of sin except by the shedding of blood. Wherever he bled, it is type, his picture of what he gave his life for. Torment, mental torment. In the end of this series, I'll be talking about that specifically. Anguish, pain. He died for it. He took 39 stripes with a cat of nine tails. It's been medically uh, calculated that the, that the major strands of diseases fall into 39 classes. Every one of his stripes, there was not a sickness left out, not an ailment, not a disease left out. He died so you could be whole. Bled from his hands, all unrighteous deeds paid for. Wherever your hands have gone, my hands have gone, that is unsanctified. Are you listening to me? Blood was shed for it. Bled from his feet. Have you been walking somewhere inconsistent with the things of God? Feet representing your travel, what you do, how you behave, your conduct. Bled from his side. Actually, that was a puncture to his heart. Everywhere he bled, he redeemed you. All internal stuff. Somebody say, oh, can you, I'm telling you, the message of the gospel is an awesome message. So Isaiah picks this up in Isaiah 53, verses uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. He says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we were healed. His stripes healed us. His blood being shed brought soundness. The Hebrew word there, soteria in the Greek, means those things that Pastor Anthony pointed out. The Hebrew word that it's his comparison is the word shalom. Peace. Soundness, wholeness, well being. He died to bring us into that because He loves us. He died to bring us into it. Now, the Holy Spirit has come as the executor of the will to make sure that everything Jesus died for, you get. Is that awesome? Everything Jesus died for, He came to make sure you get it. He's here this morning to make sure you get it. This is not some lofty promise way out. The Holy Spirit is present today. Today. To make sure you seize everything God has for you. So while the, the Holy Spirit is still working within the framework of the gospel that was preached this morning. See, when the gospel is preached, he works. Because he's not going to stand by and hear God's words proclaimed and not be active and powerful and moving. Stand on your feet, please. He's going to testify. Jesus said concerning the work of the Holy Spirit in the earth, said he shall glorify me. Remember that? Glorify. He's going to manifest me. He's going to establish everything I've done. And the Holy Spirit is not going to take one occasion to have the opportunity to glorify Jesus and not do it. You, you and I can't even imagine, can't even imagine that happening. It's going to manifest, it's going to manifest what Jesus did. So while you're feeling this, this atmosphere and while you're feeling this, this music being played, I want you to understand that in the house of God and, and out, even outside of the house of God,
God. I'll tell you something about music real briefly and then I'll, I'll go. We'll receive you and then we'll go. Jimi Hendrix was on acid. How many of you know who Jimi Hendrix is? Lift your hand, wave up high. Wave your hand up. He's been dead a long time. But you still know who Jimi Hendrix is. Yeah. Yeah. He was on acid when he played at Woodstock. And while being interviewed uh, afterwards, because of what happened, the crowd was just mesmerized. Jimmy said, I was playing, but it was as if though it wasn't me playing. He said, I felt like my fingers in an interview. I felt like my fingers could do what they had never done before. And that, that music moved across the crowd and mesmerized him. So much so that you and I still remember who Jimi Hendrix is to this day. Well, now, if that mess can go on in the, in, the, in the world of darkness, how much more? This is, here's what David did. David said, the Bible says David played and, uh, on his instruments and his instrument playing cast devils out. Did you hear that? David played an instrument and devils ran. There was something on the music. So when, these, when this worship team is worshiping and playing music, it sounds good to the ear, but there's something else going on. Something in the realm of the spirit that is dislodging stuff from you. That's why it's important that they're prepared and ready and prayed up and walking with Jesus. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Because all is yours. All are yours. You're in here this morning and uh, you need healing in your body. You need healing in your soul. Or you need healing in your spirit because that's what a gospel reaches, right? Spirit, soul, and body. If you're like the man from Lystra, Paul says, looking upon him and perceive that he had faith to be healed. Faith had come because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in, in stuffed inside the gospel, when it's preached, it's faith. gospel was preached this morning you have to mix it with faith according to the Hebrew writer and it will heal your body and it will relieve the torments of your soul and it will change your spiritual constitution forever so if you need to be healed in your body you need to be healed in your soul you need to be healed in your spirit I'm going to ask you to come this morning to the altar. You need to be healed. You just need to be healed anywhere. Anywhere. If faith is alive, if faith is alive in you, that the gospel has the power to do it, then the Holy Spirit wants to do it in you this morning. You need to be healed anywhere. anywhere in the spirit, soul, or body. This is an act of faith. It's an act of faith. I want you to understand your very steps leaving your seat coming to this altar is an act of your faith 
you're saying, Lord, I'm not coming because Pastor Flowers called me to come. I'm coming because I believe that the gospel has the power to heal any physical need, any soul need, any spiritual need. I believe the gospel has the power to heal me. I believe the gospel. 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 Now with your hands stretched up, I'm just going to pray that the power of the Holy Spirit who works in concert with the gospel, confirming God's word being spoken, signs and wonders and diverse gifts of the Holy Ghost, that he would come upon you now driving the night before last between Philadelphia and Baltimore on I-95 and I felt the wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit come into that rental car with me it wasn't just for me although it was wonderful and healed me and spoke to me and enlightened me and gave me uh, what I needed for the hour. We talked all the way into Baltimore. It wasn't just for me, beloved. It was for you too. And so, precious Holy Spirit, just as you assured me of your glorious presence and your strong protection come come and rest upon these whose faith is at work in the gospel of Jesus Christ come rest upon these Heal their bodies wherever there is ailment, sickness, or disease. Heal, grant wisdom, and knowledge and understanding for the proper management of the body. Bring wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and then bring supernatural assistance to heal. Father, we have mistreated our bodies in so many different ways. And we're crying out to you today for mercy. Have mercy on us. Grant us understanding. Right now would be a good, a good time to, to review the next eight verses in Psalms 119 because it has to do with this. Aleph Bet, the Gimel, the third section. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word deal bountifully with thy servant I'm just speak this over you just going to prophesy it over you maybe the, the, perhaps this is this is the way of god right here for you deal bountifully with thy servant that that word bountifully it has to do with uh, with with overflowing grace deal bountifully with thy servant that that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Is this what you, the, the book is closed to us unless you open our eyes. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandment from me. My soul breaketh. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgment at all times. 
Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate upon thy statutes. Thy testimonies, here it is, thy testimonies are my delight and are my counselors. Thy testimonies are my delight and my counselors. Precious Father, deal bountifully with every soul at the altar. Every soul in this great auditorium, deal bountifully with every soul. Open our eyes so we can behold wondrous things out of the context of the gospel. Sanctify these bodies. Drive sickness and ailment and disease out of these bodies. And I want you to just lay your hands on yourself. You have your hands in air, but just lay your hands on yourself. Father, in the name of Jesus, you said that believers will lay hands on the sick. That includes their own bodies. And wherever there's sickness or disease or ailment now, Holy Spirit, come and drive it out of them. Blood disorders and heart uh, palpitations, drive it out of them. Shoulder ailments, knees, backs, in the name of Jesus. Physical symptoms in the body where there's, where there's wrong, out of order things. Drive it out of them, Holy Spirit, by, by your own power as you testify to the resurrection of Jesus. Drive it out of them. Let health return to them. I decree and declare that health return to them. Strength return to them. In the name of Jesus. Strength. Strength from heaven. Coat everything about them. In the name of Jesus, let it run from the top of their head all the way to the sole of their feet. Let healing virtue run through them in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, glorify what Jesus did. That's what Jesus said you would do. You would glorify him. Faith is being built and we receive by faith in the mighty name of Jesus. And the people of God said amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand to praise. Come on, shout like you believe that he did what he just said. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. You remember that part from last last week I have rejoiced in thy testimonies as much as in all riches which means if I set a million dollars down and I set the testimonies of God down his word that you would rejoice more over his word or he says as much as as much as over his word as you would over a million bucks I guess you're not excited about a million bucks, huh? <laughs> Somebody place a million dollars in your hand, you go absolutely berserk. You have to have that same tenacity about God's Word. Remember what he said? With my whole heart have I sought thee. How much of my heart? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. So if you're at this altar and this is your first time having come because you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then you need to stay. You don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you need to stay. The rest of you can go back to your seats. Here's what Jesus wants to do. 
Jesus wants to make it so that there's such a line of demarcation, such a line of difference between you and the world that the world looks at you and says, what is it that you have? Why is it all working out for you? I see you walk through the same stuff I'm work walking through, but somehow you come out of it better than I do. What's that all about? God wants to make your life such a strong testimony that you're able to say, it's Jesus. It's Jesus that makes the difference. So, Father, I thank you. Thank you for this morning. I'm going to press in next, next Sunday to show. Well, actually, uh, next Sunday's fifth Sunday. In July, we, yeah, next Sunday's fifth Sunday. We, in July, we just begin to press into this matter of the fact that what Jesus did heals your physical body because the healing is in the atonement. We'll see it from Scripture. That your faith may arise. Just going to keep pushing, pushing, pushing by the power of the Holy Spirit, the, the gospel into you so that faith will arise and every ailment and disease, some of the things that used to sit before to eat, you won't do it anymore. Heal me, Jesus. Bring on the tacos. <laughs> you got to shake them loose. You got to shake some stuff loose. You got to shake it loose. Or it's going to kill you. David Wilkerson, uh, said many years ago, he said, the American church is killing itself with a knife and a fork. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> lift, up, <laughs> lift up your hands. <laughs> you probably said, yeah, Pastor, I'm glad you're done too. <laughs> and now may the Lord bless you, keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom, peace to you, nothing missing in your life and nothing broken. The power of the gospel heal you through the working energy of the Holy Spirit to bring you into what everything God did in Jesus for you that the Holy Spirit make it experiential, not myth, not theology, experiential. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne and glory to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and power and dominion both now and forever. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand to praise and you're dismissed in his presence.